what are your main duties here at Tech in terms of child abuse? Well, I, I come to Tech uh, as, a, as a clinician, a researcher, and a teacher in the area of child abuse. And so uh, my title and duties involve a lot of outreach into the community. So abused, so I work with the Children's Advocacy Center of the, of the South Plains and supervise all of their therapists, train all of their therapists in evidence-based treatments. I also have done training out at the Children's Home of Lubbock and Texas Boys Ranch and currently do some private practice work uh, at the Counseling Center at the Children's Home of Lubbock. I've also done research and training of the clinicians at Women's Protective Services, so those kids perhaps have not been abused directly, but they've observed uh, family violence. Well, it's, it's, it's a great question, and there's so many different variations in terms of uh, damaging effects. Uh, may, maybe to put it in the context, a, a, a starting place would be a study that was published or a series of studies that first were published in the mid to late 90s uh, from something called the, the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And what, what they did was they surveyed adults who were part of a healthcare system in San Diego. That was the Kaiser Permanente healthcare system. Now, a couple things that are very important about that. Number one, these were all people that had insurance and this was not Medicaid, this was private insurance. So in, in many, and what they did is they asked over 17,000 people about adverse childhood experiences and then looked at their rates of certain disorders, diseases, problems, conditions, and many of the sort of usual or expected suspects uh, were in fact related to this history of adverse childhood experiences. That is, the greater the number of childhood experiences that were adverse, the more likely people were to be depressed, abuse substances, uh, do IV drug use, those kinds of things. Things that people have known in the world of mental health for some time. But the other thing that they found, which is really groundbreaking and, and should get the attention of a lot of folks, is that these adults, again, who were employed and had in health care insurance, also, when there were more adverse childhood experiences, there was a greater likelihood that they had things like diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, obesity, uh, virtually any medical condition you can imagine, there were higher rates of those conditions that went along with higher rates of these adverse childhood experiences. But what they suggest is that there is perhaps some sort of uh, change in lifestyle that gets precipitated by these abusive events that then places one at risk. So you, you've, you've got all manner of health conditions that appear to be related in some way to a history of child abuse and other adverse childhood experiences. Okay, so those are those those rates are what we call incidence rates. So those are uh, officially reported, substantiated cases of abuse. Mm -hmm. All right, and. And, and let me just say that, yes, it's, it's pretty well known that our rates are about double the state average, and the state average is higher than many other states. Uh, it, it's unclear what to make of that. Uh, first of all, incidence rates uh, are, are influenced by any number of things, Some, and, and, and we don't necessarily know what is acting on those incidence rates at any given point in time. But for example, with regard to child sexual abuse, we know that the incidence rates for child sexual abuse across the nation, that, that those are about 22 per thousand kids, okay? But the prevalence rates, that is when you ask adults in your childhood, were you ever sexually abused? The rates go from 22 per 1,000 to one in four women 
and one in six men. Now, there's a big, big difference between 22 per thousand and one in four. And, and so many people are not reporting abuse. What, what does that represent? What it, are the rates, in fact, higher? Is it just the substantiated rates? Is the, is the prevalence higher in this region? Uh, because another possible explanation, and I don't want to sugarcoat it, but another possible explanation might be that in Lubbock we're doing a better job of identifying abuse. Now, but that could be one explanation. So there, there, while there are policies and there are laws at the state level, you know, how those are implemented, how those workers are supervised, uh, how team members work together in a community or don't work together can influence reporting rates and, and substantiation rates. So it's, it's really difficult. It, it, it certainly gets one's attention that the rate is higher, but it's tough right now to know what to make of that. My, my sort of area of focus has been child sexual abuse. Uh, and uh, child sexual abuse doesn't really follow any tr particular trends in terms of economy. The people that sexually abuse children tend to do that whether the economy is good or the economy is bad. I would say what I have noticed is that there are more young people now who are being apprehended, convicted, uh, referred to family court, referred for treatment programs because they are sexually abusing other younger children. So several years ago the National Children's Alliance and they were tracking who the perpetrators of child sexual abuse were. Forty percent of their cases nationwide, forty percent were perpetrators who were teenagers. and. Again, we don't know why that is, but the conventional wisdom is sort of rooted in a concern that as stress increases for families, physical abuse also increases. So if financial stress is impacting a family, that potentially can then increase the rates of physical abuse. Uh, neglect. Uh, probably to, to some degree would be affected in the same way, uh, though, some, yeah. So in, in terms of the, the, the toll that doing child abuse work does, I, I think for me, w when I see kids I'm in, that have been abused and how they're doing, I, I'm, I'm actually inspired by those kids. I think uh, to, see, to see them persevere really is nothing short of insulty. So. If, if, if I had a wish list and, and, and my wish could come true, it would be that we would probably have to start by revising licensure standards because t typically schools and professions uh, teach to licensure requirements. And until, until a license in psychology or a license in medicine requires systematically certain experiences and classroom teaching, then for the public, the, the outlook is not particularly promising. Uh, so to me, that would be probably the, 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 the biggest need. I think somewhere after that would be the need for um, more spending uh, at the federal level on, on research. Uh, not about the is it a problem or is it not a problem, but rather how to do the best treatment possible. But I, I saw some cases at the end of my training in a medical setting and then ended up working at a child placing agency in Texas where I would review stacks of records on each child prior to their admission into this living situation. And over and over and over again, what I would see is, is kids that were being misdiagnosed with things like ADHD uh, because they had concentration problems, 
but people were not skilled, they were not trained, they did not know to look for abuse, and some of the disorders that have symptoms that mimic ADHD. So post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, has symptoms of concentration difficulties, irritability, and sleep problems. Those symptoms are also symptoms of depression, and two of those three symptoms are symptoms of ADHD. So we would see kids that would get a diagnosis, and then as their stay at this agency unfolded, we'd learn about abuse, and so in retrospect, we'd see how they were misdiagnosed. So really based on that experience, the, the, the line of study I've pursued is, is related to diagnostic issues and assessment with, with the notion that good treatment is predicated on good assessment. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the ACE study and I guess kind of the, the progression of the progressions that, and the stages that you know it goes through? Uh, authors, what the authors suggested is, is again this, how do we explain, how do we explain this link between these adverse childhood experiences and, and things like these disease processes. So uh, th they, they speculate, and they cannot make conclusions based on their data, but they, they speculate that you, at, at sort of the very basic level, uh, a, a lot of people experience adverse childhood experiences. And then for a subset, a, a smaller number, that leads to direct symptoms or to changes in lifestyle. So for example, let's say that uh, someone is stressed and they start eating a particular kind of food or greater amounts of food, uh, which then creates other stresses within the organism, okay, situations which, which may lead, for example, to diabetes and then that leads to increased mortality, early death, uh, and then that gets passed back along to their children. So if, if I am incapacitated by virtue of my health and, un and unable to supervise my child because long ago I was abused, developed these habits which now put me at risk in terms of health, now the same thing comes back full circle, all right, and influences my children. If I die early uh, and, and, and they go and live someplace else or with family members, we know that that just increases the risk of bad things happening. So that's kind of the, the, the notion that lots of people are affected by different kinds of abuse and adverse experiences, but a, but a portion of those uh, end up with health problems or early mortality. Uh, and then there is also this cyclical piece where then it puts my kids at risk if I'm one of those folks affected. Okay. So if let me be sure I understand. So these numbers are numbers for Lubbock County? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, those those numbers may reflect sort of the downturn in the economy that hit the entire nation. I, I think you know we'd have to know more about the categories to to really speak definitively to it. Uh, but a 39 percent cut in budget is 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 going to be substantial enough that it would probably cut not just fat but some of the meat as well. And, and so, you know, the way that the Texas uh, Constitution is set up is that we have to have uh, a balanced budget at the end of the year, which, you know, there's some advantages to that. Um, and so if we don't have money in the bank, then just like a family, sometimes we got to make some really tough decisions about where we spend it. Now, you know, I, I'm, I'm someone that's interested in children who are abused, so I'd like to see that money spent. The tough choices have to be made. Um, I might not agree with choices being made to, to cut services to abuse children, but um, uh, 
it, it, it's certainly a complex issue and 